Quarter Injury Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, uh, the host, and today we are sitting down with Calgary City, Cal- uh, not councillor, but Calgary City Mayor candidate, Zane Novak. Zane, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for having me in. I think that these podcasts, interaction, ability to get opinions and ideas out to Calgarians, to the voters, it's so necessary. And this has been a challenging little run between the pandemic, isolation, um, you know, COVID-19, all those things. And now we're in the middle of a federal election. So for someone like me to get my voice out and you to help with that and inform the voters in Calgary is so important. Thank you for doing this. Well, this episode is airing the day after the election, so ha- at the federal election. So hopefully people will get back into the municipal r- run and start talking about the municipal election the day after the election, the federal election. But I start all my interviews with any political candidate who comes on the show with the same question. Where does your sense of duty to serve come from? Well, I think that there's a couple of sources. Inherently, I was just kind of born with a desire to help out in a lot of ways. And I've always had this philosophy, even since I was just in school, that if there was something within my world, my ability, my grasp, that could help a friend or help someone with the quality of their life, I just felt it. I had to do it. It was incumbent upon me to go that extra step, share that extra thing, do that extra maneuver or that give that extra bit if it could help with a positive impact and result in someone else's life. Now here it is running for mayor. I never ever thought that I would do something like this. And I think that, you know, that that's my sense of duty. I see Calgary. I love this city. It's become my city. I wasn't born here, but I've been here for about 20 years, very involved in the community. And I don't like the direction it's going. My interaction with City Hall has left me disappointed on many levels. And we deserve better. And so this is me standing up, you know, trying to make a difference. You sort of answered my second question before I even got to ask it. <laughs> but I'm going to ask it anyway. You can give back in many different ways, whether it be nonprofit, whether it be business, whether it be through volunteerism. But you've decided in 2021 you would give back in a way that is political. Uh, running for mayor, and you said you didn't like the direction that you saw that was uh, he- sort of city council was heading. What is that direction that you don't want to see the city go down? Well, part of my involvement in the community has been, in, you know, 20,000 plus hours of volunteerism. And that's everything from boots on the ground, serving meals, basically, to uh, donations, philanthropy. But, you know, for eight years, I was president of the board of the Kirby Center. Five of those years, well, Eight years on the board, pardon me, five as president. And in that interaction as president of the board of the Kirby, took me in to connect in direct contact with city hall, city council, uh, the mayor's office, and city administration. And, you know, and just the frustration and inefficiency and disengagement and entitlement of so many individuals within those departments. I love this city. And I love Calgarians. I think that we are some of the most unique individuals, uh, creative, inventive, entrepreneurial, of any city I've ever been in, worked, lived, and we deserve better. And right now, you know, it seems like every day you get up and you're asked to pay more and get less. And that disconnect is, um, it's insufferable. It's wrong. The lack of cohesion and collaboration within City Hall I mean, I've sat in city council and I've always said, and I know this is logistically not possible, but man, to have the right to vote in Calgary, you should have to sit in city hall for about three days in chambers and watch how our councillors, how that plays out. And I think it would do two things. It would help us realize who we're electing and hopefully it'd help those who are elected to realize that those electing them are witnessing their conduct and behavior. I mean, look at Calgary. How long since we've had a major project get moved forward? Well, you know what? Oftentimes when major things don't happen, it's because there's a lack of leadership and cohesion and collaboration. And that's what I see right now. We're lacking dynamic leadership. And then I just also see, you know, there's such a combative attitude, whether it's among city council themselves, whether it's with stakeholders. I mean, continually right now between the mayor's office and the provincial premier's office, it just seems like who can poke who in the eye harder? But who pays the price for that? You know, Chris, it's you and I. It's Calgarians that pay the price for that. You touched on a lot of subjects that I, I, I love talking about. And the first is the combative nature that is city council. We are seeing, we are in a more politically uh, diverse time than we have ever been. We are 
seeing more people be left and right and not for the best of the city or the best of the country or the best of the province. How do you envision your leadership as the next mayor of the city changing that narrative to get everyone to work together for the common good? Because you talk to Calgarians across this city and they say, it's dysfunctional. Nothing's happened in the city in the last four years, last eight years, because City Hall is dysfunctional and it's not working for us anymore. You're exactly right. In fact, you know, a lot of people say, well, what do you think is the biggest crisis in Calgary, Alberta? You know, and we've had lots. We've had, we've had some toxic politics, I think, at every level in the last half a dozen years. We've certainly had economic challenges um, that we've never faced before in Calgary. And now, you know, we've had the pandemic and isolation and unemployment and all of these other things. But I think, you know, to touch on exactly what you said, the most, the, the worst thing that we're facing, and it's worldwide, it's not just Calgary, but it's certainly evident here and certainly evident in City Hall, is this polarization. Extreme leftism, extreme rightism, and nobody wanting to meet in the middle and have a conversation and talk. And it's been my experience in my life in small and large business that if you want to make a change, first of all, before you can change anything, you need to understand the problem. And to understand a problem, you often need to go and be humble enough to go to the people who are involved in the day-to-day operation. Boots on the ground, hand in the game, because oftentimes it's their living. And in some cases in business I've been in, if it's done wrong, it could be their life. Talk to them, because they're going to see it from a perspective that no one else sees it from a bureaucratic level. Number two, you need to be sure that people have and feel respected. They have to have a seat at the table and the voice in the conversation. I started on this, you know, with a platform called Calgary 2.23 years ago, Calgary 2.0. And at the time when we started that, I was still involved in nonprofits and I couldn't talk about running for an elected office because it could have been a conflict of interest. And I would never, you know, put one of the charities I was working with at risk. But I also wanted to start finding out what Calgarians were seeing in Calgary, what they were feeling, what they were experiencing. I mean, I know what I know in my bubble, but I don't know what's in yours, Chris. I don't know what's, you know, in, in most of the people. So we reached out through Calgary 2.0. And almost to a person, everybody said they felt that their opinion, their voice wasn't heard in City Hall. Well, how can you come to good conclusions and move the needle forward if you don't know what people's opinions are, what their thoughts are, what their wishes are? I mean, you've got to have that two-way conversation. You have to have that open door policy and you have to park your ego and agenda at the door in order to have input from all the stakeholders. And that's what I do not see in City Hall right now. I don't see people, you know, I see people putting their agenda ahead of what is good for Calgary. You can't win every battle, but you know what? You need to go in with an open mind. You need to give people respect. You need to hear them out. And then you have to be dynamic and strong enough, you know, to get them to see the bigger picture. And even with councillors as mayor, you know, it's the mayor only has one vote out of 15. There's 14 councillors, one mayor, 15 votes. You only have one vote. But I think that through my entire life, one of my main strengths has been able to get people to sit down at a table, talk about the situation at hand, and everybody sometimes has to give a little. Some have to give a lot. But you got to do these things or the whole project will fail. And we've been in a situation for eight years, I think, where the project's been failing because people have not been parking their egos and agendas. And I think that one of the skills I have is the ability to, you know, get people to see the bigger project and how that will benefit Calgary. And if you benefit Calgary, you're going to benefit the councillors and City Hall. You just mentioned diversity, and I want to talk about that for a bit because you talk to people in Ward 10, which we currently are, you're going to hear something completely different from the people of Ward 7 or Ward 4 or Ward 2 or Ward this. How do you envision making everything work? Because each ward, each person is going to have a unique voice. You talk about listening to the people, but you're going to hear millions of different uh, visions for for the city. So how do you uh, envision yourself being the mayor for everyone, even the people that don't particularly agree with the decisions you're making? Well, I think there's a couple of things that need to come into play in that statement. Number one, you cannot please everyone. And I think that's what politicians right now try to do. They try to win every vote. They try to say whatever the flavor of the moment is to get, you know, that vote at that moment. And I always say, there are going to be people who, there are going to be people who like me, and there will be people who don't like me. 
And like I always say to my team, well, you know, if I wanted to please everybody, I would get an ice cream truck and I'd park it at Sandy Beach on a hot day. But you know what? Someone would walk up to that ice cream truck and be upset because they're lactose intolerant, right? Yeah. You can't please everyone. And I think that politicians fail when they try to, you know, do this, these, these statements to please everyone. So I think what you need to do, and that's why we're in a democracy, you need to hear what is, you know, the best for the moral majority, and you need to make sure that it's based on fact, on reason, lots of times even on math, and go with that. You need to make sure that you're moving the city forward in a positive manner. And one of the things I think that we often fail when it comes to politics is politicians. I've always said, long before I ever thought I'd get into politics, I always said politicians have two jobs in their life. One is to get elected, and two is to get reelected. And in the pursuit of those two jobs... Those two missions, they often forget, A, why they even started to run in the first place. And 99% of the time, they forget what's really important to their constituents. So, you know, my goal in this is I only plan on running for two terms. I do not believe that career politicians are beneficial to anyone. And I think, you know, in running for those two terms, especially that second term, you can really do the things that are visionary. Because all of a sudden now you're doing what's healthy for Calgary for 30 years from now or 10 years or 15 years from now rather than that predestined election date that's, you know, at the end of that four-year term, right? This one would be October 18th. So now, you know, you're not worried about having to make the difficult decisions. And it's a little bit like parenting, right? I mean, your, your, your child can get, you know, step on a nail and get, get blood poisoning. And you can hold that child and, 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 and coddle that child and, and give that child milk and cookies until that child passes away from blood poisoning. Or you can go to the doctor and you put him on IV and have to put him in a hospital bed in order to combat. The, you know, one, easy, one decision is easy in the short term, but the right decision sometimes is, is tough in the short term, but good in the long term. And I think that we've lost a lot of that vision as politicians. And that comes down to the strong dynamic leadership and i mean that's why things like you know how, how many years have been kicking around the green line i mean that green line is supposed to be built for four billion dollars and i think it was supposed to be 48 kilometers long now it's 5.6 billion dollars with a potential cost overrun of five billion dollars and it's a what a quarter of the length it's like 10 or 15 kilometers something like that and, and calgarians are still at the point where they don't believe it's actually going to happen until they actually see it operate. That's right. Day. And, you know, they're in there. So talk about the Green Line for a half a moment. I mean, there's, you know, three of the four of the individuals that are strong contenders for me, you know, do not realize the math around this Green Line. They keep saying it's a great idea. Not because it's providing transportation or because it's this or it's that or it's making us more livable city. They talk about because it's going to create 20,000 jobs. But it's not going to create 20,000 jobs. It's 20,000 man hours of job. Pardon me, man years of jobs, which is about 15, 1,600 jobs a year for six years. Well, there's a lot of difference between 20,000 jobs and selling it that way as to the reality of it being about 1,600 jobs. And yet three of these individuals have voted on in the past because they're part of city council and they do not recognize the difference between 20,000 jobs and 20,000 man-year jobs. So when I look at leadership like that, how can we be confident of the outcome? I mean, it's probably one of the reasons we lost the Olympic lit bid. So we didn't really know as Calgarians what we were bidding on, what we were getting. Was it a pig and a poke or would it have been the miracle that would have made Calgary relevant again like you know the 1988 Olympics did? We didn't know. Because we don't have leaders that know how to even understand the situation themselves, let alone explain it to us as voters and as residents and as the ones who pay the tax and pay the bills. Look at our arena deal. How many years has that been kicked down the road? I mean, what are we going to get out of it? And what is our portion in it? I'm, I mean, I support infrastructure like that. I support a new arena. It will bring in outside money. It will bring in outside jobs. But man, when I see the individuals on city council that voted for it, and what I feel is their lack of understanding of the business sense of going into a situation like that, I don't have a great amount of confidence that they cut the best deal for Calgarians. I hope they did. I want a new arena. I want events here. Even if you don't like the Flames, they only play 41 games there a year unless they make the playoffs. Well, that leaves us 320 other days that we can have concerts, trade shows, bring in money from outside, fill our hotels, fill our restaurants, fill our downtown core. But did City Council get us the best deal? 
I am not confident. You have mentioned a few things that uh, you were going to talk about later on, but let's talk about them now. The arena being the number one topic, because let's put the green line on the back burner here for a second, because hypothetically it's going ahead, quote unquote, going ahead, <coughs> but we'll talk about that in a few seconds. The arena. Um, I'm a marketing person. I, I look at things as a, from a marketing perspective. You, we are one of the largest cities, if not the largest city in the province. But if you look at concerts and attracting concerts, they usually go to the capital cities. So we are going to have a hard time filling this arena to begin with. And you look at the reports that are coming out from city council, and I know you can never trust exactly what's coming out from city council because the politicians put their own spin on things. This is going to cost the average Calgarian a lot of money for this. And if you want to go to a Flames game, it's going to cost you more to go to a Flames game now. How can you, as next mayor, look at city residents and say, you know what, we need to make sure this is the best deal, but it's already in the works. It's signed, it's delivered, it's going ahead. How can we make sure that this is a good deal for the city of Calgary? Because people want to know that their money that they're paying in taxes, and you talk to residents, they're pissed off that they're paying as much as they are, are going to good things and being used properly. I agree with you. You know, oftentimes our city council and our mayor have repeatedly said that, oh, we pay such a low percentage of tax compared to other uh, municipalities and urban areas in Canada. And, you know, the research that my team has done shows that that's very inaccurate. We're a city of one and a half million. One million five hundred and thirty thousand is what is projected to be this year. Uh, Edmonton is nine million seven hundred and thirty thousand. Nine million, did I say that? Yeah. 973,000. So 973,000, we're 1.5 million. Yeah. So, you know, we're half again as large as them. But yet per cost, and if you look at budgets, they their cost per person on budget, operating budget, is 20% less than ours. And yet they have snow removal and things like that. You know, it's shocking. There's a whole bunch of details I could go into. So number one, yeah, we have a spending problem. We don't have a tax problem in this city. We have a spending problem in this city. And if you want to talk about taxes, you need to talk about spending. One of the reasons I am positive about things like the arena is because it is something that can bring in revenue from outside the city. Now, when Edmonton, a city with, you know, two-thirds of the population of us, put in Rogers Place there within the first 10 days when Garth Brooks was there, not even counting the ticket sales, the concession sales, they brought in an extra $50 million into that city from Calgarians and other people who drove there, filled their hotels, their restaurants, their bars, their shops, their parking, their everything else. We need that attraction here. We need outside money coming here. I mean, we spent $250 million on a beautiful library that we tucked into a legacy project where you can only see the world-class architecture if you have a drone. Nobody talks about operating costs of any of these things. Nobody talks about the fact that probably the operating costs of that library based on square footage and ops costs, the half a million square feet with a 50 foot high ceiling and all wood on the inside, you know, that's going to be running you 20 bucks a square foot. That's, you know, we're going to have 10, 20 million dollars just to keep the doors open without employment on that library. And how many people from Flin Flon or from, you know, Vulcan say, hey, Let's go to Calgary for the weekend and enjoy the library. It's a beautiful library. Don't get me wrong, and I'm, I'm happy it's here, but there was a cost attached to that that we as Calgarians will pay forever. At least if we have things like the arena. You know, we can bring in concerts. We can bring in trade shows. We can attract other people. And then we will get the people from Flynn, Flon, or from wherever coming in here to invest their time and disposable cash in our city and create valuable, profitable, uh, prosperous employment. People never talk about ops costs. Look at the green line, for instance. We want to talk about ops costs. If that gets going, and you know, that was done based on a feedstock study about eight years ago when downtown was 100% full. You couldn't even rent a, a parking stall, let alone an office. Ridership was at its max, and ops costs were about $80 million, and they calculated that ridership would pay 50% of that, about $40 million, and we as Calgarians would subsidize the other $40 million. Well, if they start building this thing now, It'll take five years to build. And I'm not even going to get into the fact that with open trenching, it's going to cost us as Calgarians an extra $5 billion Have to open trench. If they're actually going to trench those places? That's what they're talking about. That's what the last proposal is. If they take our downtown and they open trench it, people, I don't know if we realize that this will destroy three C streets 
for multiple years. Because when you open Tranch, you have to move all the utilities during that one to the adjacent streets. So that means three streets in an already challenged downtown core that are gutted for three years. Look what the construction on 17th Ave did over five years. I mean, we had dozens and dozens and dozens of businesses. I think in 2018, we had 29 businesses closed just in the first few months because everybody was scared to go down on 17th Ave. Well, the same thing's going to happen to our already gutted downtown. You're going to have 100 to 150,000 semi-loads of material just to haul out. What's that going to do to traffic? What's that going to do to our roads? How are we going to sell our downtown to attract other businesses to come here? Let alone the fact that by the time this is built, our ops costs will probably be not $80 million. I would guess it'll be more like $110, $120 million. And ridership to a vacant downtown in a post-pandemic era where people are nervous about all wedging in together on closed quarters, you know, it could be as low as $20 or $30 million. So now we as Calgarians could be on the hook to $80 to $100 million a year just to keep the wheels rolling and the doors open on that train. We need to look at these things from those perspectives. And that's why I think that, you know, one of the things that City Hall has been missing is that business sense of how the math works and how these things will profit us or be punitive to us in the long term. I want to talk about cost because you mentioned it. Pandemic has changed the name of the game. We are not in our traditional four-year budgeting cycle ever again. I hope. <clears throat> if the first decision the next council has to do is that budget, and they do a four-year cycle where they budget it for four years, you cannot do that in a post-pandemic world. And let's be honest, we're not even sure if we're out of this pandemic yet because there's the exactly. next wave. Who knows? I know we are sitting here right now, but we're socially distanced, and we are we are doing everything that we need to to ensure that the COVID numbers stay down. How do you envision? working in a post-pandemic world where budgeting has now become a unknown because you do not know if next year we're going to have to shut down our libraries again or shut down our rec facilities again. And while they're shut down, they still cost money. Well, there's that. There's so many things. You're exactly right. I mean, what if we go into the, uh, you know another wave where we get locked down and vacancy downtown just gets more and more and more and we burn into all of our corporations the habit of working from home where it will become almost impossible to fill those vacant spaces but now we're putting in a 5.6 billion dollar train that will go over budget i promise you it will go over budget 50 to 100 percent and the province has signed on for 1.53 billion and the feds for 1.53 billion locked in and we're on the hook for all the cost overruns we will never get another major infrastructure project. I have always questioned how we come to the terms we do with where the train runs in this city. I mean, that train right now is going down to Shepherd, where pretty much everybody would have to drive anyways to get to it, so it's just an option. Mm -hmm. Why don't we have connections to, like, the airport with 52,000 employees? Why don't we have stronger connections to our working communities, the Northeast, not where... Lots of them don't have a vehicle in the driveway, let alone three, which is what most people had when they put it out to the west, to Aspen. It just becomes an option. Oh, maybe I'll drink after work, so I'll take the train. <laughs> I mean, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but how is that fair to our uh, disadvantaged communities? You want to talk about systemic racism. Why are we not doing a better job of taking transportation to our communities that desperately need it? They need it to get to work. They need it to get to school. They need it to get to university. They need it to get to work or uh, to relatives, to amenities, doctors. We could just do such a better job with that, this money, I believe. We are in the Northeast, which was one of the hardest hit during COVID-19. It is also one of the most diverse areas of government. Yes. And I want to talk about diversity because it is something that is sorely lacking in this election. People will, and I, I, I keep on commenting on Twitter, and I know Twitter's not the be-all and all <laughs> of society, but it seems like, and I appreciate you coming out here and sitting down in the Northeast uh, to talk to me about this, but there seems to be a forgetfulness that the Northeast exists because you see candidates doing events in the Southeast, Southwest, Northwest, but the Northeast, because we have a lot of more variety of languages that are spoken, it seems sometimes, we're speaking English right now, it seems sometimes that we forget our citizens who don't speak English. How do you connect with those people? How are you connecting with those people right now to ensure their voices are heard, but also you connect with them and ensure that they don't feel like they're not being heard? Well, that's such an important part of my campaign. 
Uh, for an example, yesterday uh, morning at 8.40 in the morning, I did a uh, piece on Red FM. And it was very interesting talking to the host there. And he was saying, yeah, you know, we were thinking about doing an event here. This is before we weren't on the air. And there are so many communities in here. There are 93 different countries represent that area and initially we were going to you know do this thing and put flags up on the building from when it hit 93 we realized it just wasn't <laughs> possible so yeah how do you you can't even put 93 flags on a building how do you reach out to 93 communities well we're trying and one of the things that you know we're really working on myself and my team on our platform is a thing called participatory budgeting now, participatory budgeting, you know, we're not inventing this, but we are certainly bringing a unique version of it. It's been used in other cities. It started out in Brazil. It's been to Medellin, Colombia. It's been literally, I think, thousands of cities around the world. And that's where the municipal government puts together a fund. It's like a grant. The way we envision it would be like a grant. And you as a community, normally it's geographic, but we want to change that. We want to do not just geographic communities, but ethnic communities, demographic communities. Where you can put together a social enterprise style business, come and apply for funding, and the seed money would come from the municipality, the mentorship, the help, the guidance, and this could be used. Like, for instance, the Filipino community. There's 100,000 Filipinos in Calgary, and they fought for years to get a little chunk of land, a little plot of land at the Prairie Winds Park so they could put up a statue to one of their national heroes, Jose Rizal. It took him years for a little chunk of land. They're like, Where's our community hall? We would love to have a community hall where we could have a social enterprise that then would have a daycare, it would have medical offices, it would have law offices. It would, you know, it'd be self-sustaining, but it'd be our community. So this type of fund could go for that. Or, you know, let's say, you know, you're a Punjabi community or a Sudanese community or whatever, and you, you want to have something for your children after school to help them with scholarships, to get into university. Or maybe you want to show, you're the a Colombian community, you're Venezuelan, Peruvian. You want to have a festival. And you want to maybe have access to the stampede grounds to do it. Right now, it's so cost prohibitive. We use that thing just a few days of the year because nobody can afford to walk on that property. Um, we need to review all these things and invest in our community. You know, they always talk about the U.S. being in the melting pot of the world. Canada was always defined as the mosaic, where communities came here and kept their kind of identity. And that's a two-edged sword. I mean, it's, that's great. But the downside is, is we create silos of isolation and that's not good we need to understand we're all calgarians as we are all canadians and there's nothing wrong with keeping your traditions your dance your food your singing your clothing your traditions your history but share that with the rest of us so with this social enterprise with participatory budgeting let's say for instance the filipino community successfully put forward a grant proposal and we helped them community hall that then showcased the, all their stuff well, they now, as part of their business plan, have to explain and show how they're going to share that with other communities. So they don't just go to their community hall and that's where the Filipinos go and stay. No, it gets shared with the rest of us as Calgarians. Imagine if we did that in a number of ethnic communities. Imagine how we could champion this city to the rest of Canada, in fact, the rest of the world, saying, come here. We have a festival three times a month. Yeah, we got Stampede. It's the greatest outdoor show in North America. It's 10 days. But you know what? Every month we have two or three shows. Every month we have two or three festivals. Every month we have two or three parades. Now imagine how we would start to attract youth from all the world to start coming back here like they used to, and they aren't right now. We have to change that. That's another topic that, you, that needs to be addressed. You, you, have, you are... I, I love when politicians and candidates come into the show and talk so passionately like you have been doing because... You, you make my job a lot easier, so I don't need to even talk. I don't even have to ask questions because you seem to be on, like, you know what I'm about to ask. Um, but I want to stick to uh, diversity for, an ish, for a moment before we talk yes. about retention of, uh, attraction and retention of youth, but also our residents. Uh, the Northeast, and I've asked this to all the candidates, the Northeast <clears throat> is having an issue with justice. It's having an issue with crime. It's having an issue with drugs. And I'm not saying that as a bad thing, because I think we, our best days are ahead of us. I'm saying that because when I moved here, when I when we were deciding to buy a house, I looked at the stats and I wanted to see, I wanted to feel safe. Uh, my uh, family, my husband's family is of color and they feel 
funny face sometimes because they don't feel like sometimes the police might be looking after them or they could be stereotyping them. And I'm not trying to say all police do that because a Calgary Police Service is a good service. How do you ensure everyone feels welcomed and safe in our community? I think this is a classic question, and there's always been a classic political response to any time there is an response. issue. No, and then this is what offends me. It's one of the reasons I'm getting into this. You know, as soon as something racist happens, whether it's a person of color or someone wearing a, a, a headgear that offends someone else for some ridiculous reason, Everybody who's in a political thing seems to grab the microphone, yell for five minutes, and next year we have the same problem. I mean, it's happened with our indigenous communities, it's happened with residential schools. I mean, the list goes on and on. I think to make change, you have to do uh, transformational things, not transactional things, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So the participatory budgeting is one of them. Um, but I got a couple other ideas, but kind of, you know, the participatory budgeting and starting to showcase our ethnic communities and highlight what we really have here. Because I don't, under like, we went to things like Chinook Blast, you go to these other events, and man, the diversity in the city is incredible, right? There are so many nations, so many people of color, so many people of different backgrounds and ethnicity, and we need to start showcasing that. But I think one of the things where this city and this country has missed out for years and years and years. And it's not really a municipal thing, but when you're mayor of the fourth largest city in the country, the city that's usually the economic driving engine of the con country, you can advocate for things. And one of the things that I think we've missed out on is recognition of certification. We have individuals who come here from all over the world and have invested so much time and money in their home countries to have a degree whether that's, you know, to be an engineer, to be a lawyer, to be a doctor, to be a nurse, to be whatever. And you come here and it's not recognized. And there's not an economical, fiscally reasonable way to get recertified. So what happens? These individuals work at, you know, Circle K. They drive cabs. They sweep shop floors. They take, you know, some of the most menial blue collar collar jobs and they are so impoverished oftentimes that they can't even put together the funds for their children to go to university. It's usually their children's children do. So here we are three, three, three generations in before we really start to have a structure where prosperity, personal wealth, personal gain, and personal pride can really be felt. And then you wonder why we have segregation. We wonder why we have all these things. I want to advocate with the provincial and federal government and really with do everything within my ability to streamline the system for those to get recertified and to do it maybe in a, we, we put, you know, social service monies into so many things. Why don't we support families so those breadwinners can go and in six months have an upgrade? Because yeah, sure, if you're an electrical engineer in Poland or, you know, Kazakhstan or, you know, anywhere, anywhere it's a different electrical code in here, yep. but the theories of electrons is the same everywhere. So why can't they have that done in a couple of months or three months and bam, now all of a sudden they're, they're making a job. They're at a job that's making three times or more than what they would be making at Circle K. And now they start to create that wealth. Now their children can go into post-secondary. We are missing out. Calgary is missing out on such an opportunity. We're missing out on millions of success stories that should be and could be. You know, I mean, that's one of the things that I think that we could champion for. Um, saw the for sale signs there are for sale signs going up across the city people are leaving calgary people are leaving because they don't feel like there are tax dollars to services and we've talked about that a little bit uh they're leaving because the job opportunities aren't the same or as they were 10 years ago when people were all collapsed they're leaving because their kids have left and they want to go retire down south so on so yep. forth we are not unique in this situation there are other municipalities facing this issue as well. How do we retain our current population but also grow? Because a growing population means better tax base, more people paying into the tax base, more potential of doing things with our tax dollars. How do you envision bringing people back to our fold to say, hey, stay in Calgary, give us hope, because we are, a t we are on the best days of our uh, past. 
we, we are getting out of the pandemic. We're getting out of the COVID downturn. We are going to be good. Because we're struggling right now doesn't mean that we're going to struggle for the rest of our lives. How do you retain people? But also, how do you bring people into Calgary and say, come here. We have some of the best people in this ward. We have the most diverse people in this ward. How do you do that in a very troubling time? So first, before I answer that specifically, there's one more point I wanted to make about diversity. Okay, and I think that sometimes uh, we forget that some of the simplest solutions are also the most cost-effective solutions. I have a friend, Sean Claude, and he has soccer without boundaries. And he reaches out to, you know, usually children from ethnic families, but it's open to everyone. And he gets them off the street into soccer, and he's had several of his players, you know, go on to like be super successful professional ones. But more importantly than that, he has about 450 kids in that program at any given time. And he has a 100% success rate of every single child that is in his program of not being killed by a gang. There's been a couple who I understand have passed away, but that's only after they've dropped out and left. He also has a 100% success rate of those in his uh, group graduating high school. Now that cost to the municipality is minuscule, but he has to fight for every penny. Why is that? I always say, if we know we had another 20 Jean-Claude's in this city, we may be able to lay off 20% of the police force. I don't believe in defunding the police. I believe, you know, there are some divisions within it, like the multicultural division. We need to be supporting them more. We need to be working with, you know, these social enterprises like Jean-Claude's, like Gargar with his Yes program. Um, you know, when I announced that I was going to be mayor, I asked for donations to a bunch of groups, and that was one of the ones that we took donations, food, computers, whatever to, to Gargar. We have many outstanding individuals, but oftentimes those individuals in our community feel like they're going it alone. We as a municipal government need to support them more. Doesn't mean we need to take over their programs because we run them very inefficiently, but we need to get behind them and make sure that they're successful. And I think that there are ways, and we don't have to reinvent the wheel, even with CPS, which is you know one of the, certainly one of the better policing forces in North America. But there are still a lot of programs out there that other municipal areas have used throughout North America that have helped them work within their ethnic communities. And I think we just need to be really open-minded. We need to break away from the traditions of we've always done it this way. And, it, you know, even though Calgary has the highest percentage of post-secondary graduates in, in Canada and having worked and lived in many cities in North America, I'd say that probably means North America, there still is a little bit of this habit in Calgary where, you know, I always say some, there should be a sign when you drive into Alberta to say, welcome to Alberta, we've always done it this way. And I think that we need to change that mentality. There are some really good programs we could in, incorporate, we could reach out to, we could customize to our city that would help with our diverse communities. And that also, coming back to the question you just asked, everybody wants a livable city. And we have a pretty livable city compared to many communities in North America. I'd say we're, we're ranked near the top, but we can do better and we will do better. But then we also need a city hall that champions that. What a lot of people don't realize is 96% of the registered business in Calgary have like 40 employees or less. But do we ever hear City Hall talking about that? You know, they'll chase the unicorns, they'll chase the Amazon, they'll chase the Google, who kind of want, and I wouldn't be unhappy if, you know, they came and brought a thousand jobs here, but they kind of want everything for free, and you, you don't give it to them for free, they're going to find another city. Why are we not championing that entrepreneurial, creative, inventive spirit that really is the spirit of Calgary? those are the jobs that really can create prosperity. But we need to create a structure within City Hall that makes it welcoming and friendly. It is cheaper, easier timeline and cost-wise, low cost, to set up a business, you know, in a place like Edmonton or Saskatoon or Regina or Winnipeg than it is here. You know, it used to be when we had all this disposable cash in the boom years, people didn't worry about the roadblocks and the obstacles because if you got it set up, there was so much free money floating around this that you would be prosperous unless you just really mishandled your business. Well, it's not that way anymore. And that's why you said, and you're accurate, we're losing people. We're losing net 15 businesses a day in Calgary. And that just means the rest of us who are left here get more thrown on us. City Hall, number one, has to figure out how to be accountable, spend our tax dollars effectively and respectfully. 
Number two, we have to do some deregulation. I know everybody talks about this, but we have to do it. We have to make this truly a small and medium-sized business-friendly city, and then we have to showcase it. We have to be creative with that to fill those vacant spaces. It's ridiculous the opportunities we're missing. I mean, I could go on and on and on and list them, but we need to address this at the grassroots. And if you're going to do this, we need to sit down with the business owners who have history here, have experience, and find out what would make their life easier because if it makes their life easier, it'll make the next person's life easier. I want to go back to a statement that you just made. And I want to ask you a pointed question. And I apologize that uh, yet again, I did not prepare for this question, but you said something. You, you talked about your friend, Jean-Claude, about how if we had 20 more Jean-Claude, we potentially would be able to reduce the police force by a certain amount. And I'm not saying that... I'm, I'm, yeah, don't yeah. quote me hard on those numbers. No, I'm not it, quoting that yeah. you say you want to defund the police because you said you no. don't. But I want to ask the question, City Hall gets requests like Jean-Claude's every day. There are organizations who are always asking for money because they are looking for money and right now things are struggling. City Hall can't, and yet again, this is me saying this and not anyone else, but City Hall can't be seen as always giving money to others. Because you have to say no. Because we have a we have a pot of money every year. You can't, you, you, the city budgets have to be balanced at the end of the year. If everyone who came to City Hall got what they wanted and got the money that they request, we would be looking for service cuts because we have to cut for services because that's money over for services. How do you envision working with community groups who need money, who are looking for money and looking at the city hall for potentially help and saying, okay, guys, I, I understand that you need help, but we also need to worry about our bottom dollar because at the end of the day, I, I'm a businessman myself. I know that you don't spend more than you have. <laughs> Exactly. So what you really need to do, and this is what I learned uh, being president of the board of the Kirby, you have to really evaluate the return on social investment. Okay. For instance, at the Kirby Center, they opened in 1999 a shelter, and it was the first non-gender specific shelter in North America for abused adults, aging adults. With it, you know, there's, there's women's shelters, et cetera, et cetera, but this is the first one where you can be men, women, whatever gender identification you wanted as an aging adult and be abused. And it cost more to put an individual in a room there, but through that system, the success rate was just exponentially higher of safely transitioning that individual into low cost housing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, at the end of their stay. So you had a situation where, you know, you could put someone in a drop-in center, you know, it would cost 10 or $20 a night, or the Kirby Center, which would cost, you know, 80 or $90 a night. But then the individual going, and nothing against the drop-in center, we, we need it. But that individual could potentially live forever at the drop-in center. Whereas transitioning them into like something like the Kirby Shelter, after their two or three months, they transitioned out into low-cost housing. They just had a, a different sense of life, a different pride in life, and a different position in the community. So what you need to do is you need to look at these from a business sense and not just a socialistic sense. Yeah, it's a social service, but you still have to answer to the business side of it. So things like Jean-Claude or Gargar, and you see the outcomes for the input. And that's where you have to make the hard business decisions. And you're right, we can't just continue to give money to everything. What I've learned from running small business and large business and in 20,000 plus hours in the nonprofit community is the nonprofit community, number one, always suffers if the business community isn't prosperous because you got to pay the bills. That's the only thing. It's the only way you're going to get money to look after our disadvantaged. Number two, you can't lead your social services side of the world just with a big heart. You have to lead it also like we did at the Kirby and make some dynamic hard decisions for the overall good. And if you're willing to do that and if you're willing to study the numbers and if you're willing to do the math, you can have a good balance. The reason I talk about Gargar and I talk about Jean-Claude and why I, I love those programs also is they're investing in our youth. And if you can invest in our youth and get our youth to be part of our community, part of a contributor. Now that's, that's our solution. 
that's our solution. Not only would be taking you know burden off the police, and yeah, you know, I really want to go back and say I'm not saying lay off 20% of the police, but I mean, imagine if we could reduce the crime, the drugs, the gangs, the gang shootings by 50% in this city. Think of the load that would take off of our first responders. Immeasurable. Right now, what we often do because we fail to invest in things at the beginning of the problem, like the Jean Claude's and the Gargars programs, we pay for it at the end with the safe injection sites and the habitual crime and the habitual theft and the habitual substance abuse. We need to invest in our communities and we need to invest them at ground level at the youth side. And we need to work with those parents, those community leaders, to understand what's best for their community. It's like you said, you know, what's best for community members in the Northeast may not be best in the Southwest or the Northwest. And in fact, what might be best for community engagement in the Northeast might not be the best three blocks away in another area in the Northeast. Because even like being on Red FM and talking about how, you know, they were trying to do a community thing and they realized in the Northeast there was like 93 distinct communities there. So that's where we need to invest more in our first responders, our mental health workers, all of those ones to best understand how to work with our communities and give them structures for their success. I feel like we've scratched the surface and I love conversations like this, but we I'm just looking at the time and we're almost <laughs> at the hour. <laughs> oh. I literally didn't realize that we're almost at the hour here. So I want to I want to turn to my last set of questions. Okay. This, this is I want you to take a time machine, put yourself on October 19th. You are now the mayor designate for the city of Calgary. What is priority number one for you? Priority number one is something we're already working on. That's to have a strong transition team to help introduce myself to the bureaucratic governmental process that the municipality is. Along with that, at the same time, is to find that common ground and start to work with. And we're already starting to do this now with those who potentially could be, but on the 19th will be in council. We need to hit the ground running. We need to start making some hard, fast, positive decisions for this city immediately. Time is of the essence. We are facing so many things. Um, the last thing we can do is hesitate because it will just cost us as Calgarians more, whether it's increased costs, less services, increased vacancy rate, increased unemployment. We've got a lot of challenges, but the two things that are the most important are to understand how to work within the system here and not be beaten by the system. And number two, to make sure that city council and the mayor's office are cohesive, as cohesive as possible, while still introducing new ideas to this city. Jump forward a year in advance, 2022. As a businessman yourself and myself, you know that businesses have to put in metrics. To be successful, you need X, Y, and Z done within a year. Project, same thing. X, Y, and Z need to get done so we can move on to step phase phase two. In year one, what would you like to see accomplished for you, for the city, to ensure that you are on the right path? What metrics are you going to put in place to say, if I get X, Y, and Z done, we will be better off even a year from now than we are right now? I have some distinct plans for the downtown at the street level, not investing a billion dollars in refurbishing old buildings. Uh, to make them low-cost housing. I have plans that will be very cost-effective at street level to create vibrancy. And that's going to do a number of things. One of the most tragic outcomes that we have right now is the fact that we're growing in every age demographic in Calgary except youth. We're losing our 20 to 24 group. We're in the negative numbers. Basically, our young adults coming out of school, high school, transitioning into post-secondary, the workplace, we're losing. We have to change that. One of the ways is vibrancy. And one of the ways, certainly, is by showcasing and we have a whole plan about how we can work with small businesses to have those creative, innovative uh, groups and individuals locate here to help give them opportunities for success to fill our vacant spaces. And that also provides great, prosperous opportunities and jobs for our youth. So vibrancy it's in, within our communities, creating a stop on the, on the youth drain and starting to fill our downtown spaces without adding additional billion dollars in burden of taxpayer costs to the downtown, which then just has to be paid off, which actually makes a roadblock and not a bridge to business. Take a moment, look at that camera, talk to the people who are listening. This one right here. Oh, that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> talk to the people who are listening. Why should you be the next mayor of this city? 
I truly believe that with my background in small and large business, my commitment of over 20,000 volunteer hours to the nonprofit sector, I'm the only candidate that brings a blend of how to successfully run a corporation, but respectfully look after our disadvantaged communities. And we need someone who has a business sense in this city and running City Hall. But even more importantly, we need a leader who will work collaboratively with our stakeholders, we'll work collaboratively with City Council, but certainly with our taxpayers and our province. Our federal government, obviously, but you know, our biggest single stakeholder is our province. And right now we have a City Hall. In fact, I have a mayoral candidate that every day speaks about how much they dislike the province and the policy there. We need to change it. We need to be working together and not against. In order to get to October 19th, in order to get to year one, you need to get elected first. You need volunteers. You need people to reach out because while we can, you can have conversations like this, I, I will ask you questions that someone else might not want to ask or they might want to ask you certain other questions. How can people reach out? How can people get involved in the campaign? How can people learn more? Well, the best way really is to just go and Google me. And it's Zane, Z-A-A, I can't even spell my own name today, Z-A-N-E, the number four, Mayor. Zane for Mayor, and it's .ca, but I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, the web, everything. Go there, click on the volunteer uh, button, or you can ask questions. If you want, donate. Donations are always welcome. Um, we have been running our campaign because I want to run City Hall fiscally responsible. Our campaign, we are running... I would guess at less than 20% of the cost of anyone else's who's a major contender, and we're really proud of that. I have such a brilliant creative team around me, and my team is so diverse, and they're a lot younger than me too. Everybody thinks that, yeah, I've got a certain demographic here. My team is brilliant, and we're doing things that no other team has done, but we do need help. You're right. We do need volunteers. We need input, and we need donations. Please go to Zane for Mayor. Click on the volunteer button. Ask me a question whatever let's change the future of our city i believe in calgary because i believe in calgarians and i cannot do this alone uh for my listeners and for my viewers uh the links to zane's facebook uh, instagram twitter website will be in the show notes below and for the audio in the show notes in the podcast uh zane thank you so much for doing this this has uh, been chris this is a pleasure I, I wish you the best <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you so much and once again you know what you do and others do within our community to help get the voice of all the candidates out. Everybody always says, get out to vote, get out to vote. October 18th, get out to vote. I always say, get informed and go out and vote on October 18th. Because your vote is the future of this city. Make sure it's informed. It's powerful. And Zane just wrapped it up best, better than I could have. Because I always end that saying, get out, get involved. Because this is the future of our city that we're talking about. And at the end of the day, if you don't get out and vote... Please do not complain. Do not. Do not <laughs> so <please>. true. <laughs> <laughs> Just get out and vote and get educated because vote for the person who's best aligned with your ideals, your values, and uh, we have a lot of choices this election. A lot. a lot more than we ever have ever had. But Zane, thank you so much for doing this once again. Thank you, Chris.